HR challenges in retaining and hiring talent in digital era. It's been a long time when the, uh, this uh, lockdown has been uplifted and it's an opportunity to meet all of you here and it's a pleasure to meet all of you. Second thing I want to say is that today is Maha Ashtami and we are all, there must be a few people who must be fasting. So we are thankful to you, all of you, that you have taken out your precious time and joining us here in today's panel discussion. But before we start, I would just request Govind to please come on the stage and present the HR Success Talk presentation to make you understand what HR Success Talk is all about. Uh, thank you, Payal, for inviting me and thank you everybody, especially to our moderator and esteemed speakers uh, for coming here and being part of our 23rd HR Things Meet, which is basically a hybrid uh, model where we will have people being present here. At the same time, uh, we are live on seven platforms, uh, including four countries. So hope that uh, the topic of today, which is very interesting, especially for business leaders and HR professionals to uh, find out how can they retain their talent and uh, uh, also at the same time, hire uh, talent in this such a competitive world. Um, I have been given responsibility by Payal to uh, take you guys through uh, about HR success talk and what this platform is all about. So I'll uh, go and take four to five minutes to take you guys through that. Uh, HR Success Talk is a community of uh, 150,000 HR and business leaders across the world. As you can see, we have four flags down, which means that we are present right now having chapters in India, UAE, Ghana, and Saudi Arabia. And we are continuously spreading our wings to other parts of, uh, of the world. Moving on, uh, we are a community which is a network of HR, by HR, for HR. And our vision is to uh, share knowledge with each other um, by bringing HR and business leader together. Uh, we have, these are the four uh, country heads we have uh, in different countries. And as you can see that uh, it's a great, great example of woman power as we have three of our uh, country leads and heads uh, women in that. And they are doing fabulous job. Uh, moving on. Why we exist, as, as I said, it's a global, global platform uh, which brings HR and business leader together. And our primary objective is basically to discuss business related problems connected with talent and try to solve them and provide best practices back to industry and HR audience. Um, if you are a part of HR success talk in any way, there are three immediate benefits which you get. Uh, share and learn, be a mentor or find mentee. Um, also, you can mentor somebody else, you can get, you can find mentors. Networking, I don't have to say that how important and impactful networking could be. You can use it for your learning, you can use it for your, to find new jobs, you can uh, use it to find business opportunity, anything you want to do. This is a learning ecosystem. So to achieve our vision of HR Success Talk, we have this wheel which supports to achieve our vision, which is webinar, HR forum, social media, strings meet, YouTube assessment, HR awards, and blogs and websites. So this is uh, these are the wheel by which we try to achieve our vision. In upcoming slides, I'll take you quickly through all of them. Moving on, uh, webinars we started during COVID. So far, we did 36 webinars since April 2022. So in two years, we did 36 webinars, and you can see some examples of that. Uh, moving on, um, we have uh, our upcoming uh, webinar coming on, uh, coming on moving forward with mentoring. We are doing this webinar in collaboration with Mentor City, which is a Singapore-based uh, mentoring tool and uh, portal, very, very popular. They have come into our platform to talk about how mentoring can help organizations to build a learning ecosystem. So stay tuned, 7th May. This is our HR forum with 20,000 registered member. If you have any questions on HR, you need format, you need any kind of policy, you have a legal questions, labor question, any question, go to our forum. You can just ask questions and there are 20,000 HR professionals willing to answer your question or you can answer their queries. Moving on, this is the presence of our 
uh, social media, you can see forum, WhatsApp, Facebook, website, moving on to the next one, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, these are the numbers. And if you total all, you get 150,000 members across the globe. Uh, this is the glimpse of our HR Strings Meet. You guys here, personally, who are present, you are part of our HR Strings Meet. This is 23rd. People who are watching us globally, you can see the glimpse of some of the pictures of the Strings Meets we have recently conducted. Um, and previous ones where this is more like pre-COVID uh, pictures you see on the screen. We used to have a lot of fun activities as well. This is our YouTube channel. In our YouTube channel, you get an opportunity to watch playlists. And playlists are like uh, complimentary or, or free of course, courses available out there, which people can go through. And these are some of the playlists which you can see on your screen. And uh, we also have assessment and certification, which is very simple, that if you want to get certified by giving simply an assessment in any field of HR, you can do so. As you can see, we have so far done 20 online assessments and certified hundreds of HR professionals. Uh, this, these are the two one. The first one is learning and development. And uh, this is an assessment. Anybody online, offline who wants to participate can register. And on 14th of April, you will be given a one day time to finish your online assessment. And if you score 50% more, you get an assessment or you get a certification from HR Success Talk. After that, we will be launching the HR analytic uh, assessment or certification, which have, we will have an online assessment on May 12th. Uh, going forward, uh, we also have a certification coming up on safety and well-being and happiness. We are doing it with the young minds. The registrations are open for it. If you are willing, you will have links on your chat box and you can go and register to do that. HR awards. Uh, let me spend some time here because uh, so far we have done five awards and we are in the sixth awards right now. Interesting news. HR Success Talk has already launched its sixth award which is called the Global Excellence Award 2022. FYI, we do it twice in a year. Good news, which people normally ask us, we do not ask any nomination fees by anybody who is nominating for this award. Better news that it is a global one. If I give you a last time figure, out of 50 awards we have given, um, we had uh, awardees from, of course, all the countries we have, UA, Ghana, and Saudi and India, but we had people from Philippines, UK, US who have been given awards. Uh, we have launched 10 categories. If you're interested, you can go back to our, go to the next slide, please. You might see that, uh, that one. 15th April is the last date for that to, uh, to participate. And uh, there are 10 categories, 30 winners. So far, we already have crossed 50 nominees, which are coming up. And we always have a track record of finding more nominations at the end date. So hurry up if you want to uh, nominate yourself for any category. For that, you can go to our website and you can also go to our Facebook page. You will have ample information out there. All right, um, Edge Talk is basically a fire chat, a talk show, which is being led by a Karnataka state chapter. And the recent one, which is coming up today itself at 6, 6 p.m. will be live on our social media channels. It is on shaping the organization culture post pandemic. And thank you, Arvind, if you are online for moderating this session. Uh, these are some of our media coverages, uh, go ahead. Um, and then our blog and website, uh, you can find a lot of interesting blogs. If you are interested in writing something for our website, something unique, nothing which you wanted to do, we are not interested much in the duplicate content, but if you want to write something unique, you can, you can reach out to our blogs team. Uh, simply by going to our Facebook and you send a message, our team will reach out to you and we will publish your blog and make it public for others to uh, digest and take benefit out of it. This is myself. I'm, I have founded this uh, community 10 years back and uh, as you can see, we have grown to uh, 150,000 supported by our advisor, Mr. Gupta and Mr. Himanshu. Both are here from our advising team. Uh, who always support me how to go uh, this is our team again 64 percent of our volunteers are women another another uh, way of saying that we believe a lot in women in power and the quality they bring on the table right that's the that's the best and most important thing uh although we are a community but we work very similar like a global organization now you look at the structure you can see we have advisors and country heads and presidents and vice presidents and managers and volunteers, you won't believe we have 100 volunteers across the globe. 
So it's like a mini organization itself, but although it's a community which supports others. See, go ahead. Uh, if you want to be our volunteer and you want to contribute to this community, there are four things you need. First of all, you should know this is coming straight from your heart. It's not a paid, paid uh, community. It is a voluntary exercise. And you should have a team to help others, willing to invest some time, not only to help others, but also upgrade yourself and develop your career, eager to learn. These are the four bigger qualities we need. Um, moving forward, um, these are some of the opportunities available in different verticals. So if you want to apply, you can apply. You can send an email to hr.hrsuccesstalk.com, hr.hrsuccesstalk at gmail.com. Or again, you can simply go to our Facebook page and just leave us a message. Our team will be in touch with you. With that said, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, watching us online, to the online audience, and uh, to all those who are present here. And once again, I am excited about today's talk. And I'm sure you guys will be, because let me tell you, India is growing. And I think post-pandemic, people might have thought that the business will go down. It looks like we all were wrong. The business is going skyrocket. This is a good problem to have, that now we are not able to find people. It's a good problem to have that the organization have to put a lot of efforts to retain their people. So thank you again to our moderator and speakers for being here and coming with such an experience uh, and sharing with all of us. And with that said, I think we need to move forward with this event. So I'll call Pyle back to the stage and take it forward uh, to the event. Thank you, Pyle. Thank you, Govind. Uh, I hope everyone must have understood very well about what HR Success Talk is all about. Before we move to our panel discussion, our partner Cyborism has planned a small activity for our audience who is live sitting here just to pep up the energy and bring in the energy so that we all are charged up well for our session. I request Pooja to please come on the stage and take the activity forward. Thank you. Hello everybody, I am Pooja Gupta from Cyberism and today I have a small and very interesting quiz plus activity for you all. And before I announce this activity, let's talk about the reward. What is the reward? Because without that, I won't find that you know that zeal in the audience to answer me up. So uh, there is an open training of advanced Excel from Cyberism this coming Saturday. May I know what is the date on this coming Saturday? 16th, all right. So on 16th and 17th, we have an open training of advanced Excel, which has a cost. But if any one of you who can answer me all three to four questions out of five questions will receive this training 100% discounted and redeemed. So I hope all of you are ready. Okay, let's start with our first question. So, first question is, who is the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka? Like, whoever it is right now. Uh, I need the full answer. No Google, please. <laughs> Okay, half will also do. May I know the name? Uh, um, so, Mahita Rajbo Paksha. Okay. May I know your name? That's completely okay. May I know your name? Samir. Okay. So, first answer is given by Samir. Great. Okay, second question. You guys need to be a little active in this. Let me see who can show me one rupee coin with them. I can find some here now. <laughs> Is it one rupee? <laughs> okay, let me see that. He looks like he's very excited to take advanced Excel training. Great. Okay. So 
of my third question, which is very, very difficult, but you guys, I guess you can answer it. Who is the founder of HR Success Talk? And in this year, it was founded. Okay, great. Third answer is also really great. I would request others also to answer me. Okay, my fourth question. So, in 15 seconds, you need to tell me how many tables we have in this room. Can I start? So we are including this also as a table, this also as a table. Then it comes to be great. Okay, our last question, which is the most difficult question of this world. Any guesses what it can be? I would like to know the price of the petrol today. Very much so. One zero five, one zero six, going like that. So yeah, thank you for participating in this quiz. And there is a voucher which I'll be sharing with Mr. Samir shortly. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Pooja. That was a very exciting exercise. I hope our audience liked it. Now, coming back to our topic, our today's panel discussion is all about the challenges that the HR is facing in the professional life and in this digital era. So, the process of hiring is often a long and complex journey. Modern technologists can help the companies talk about some aspects, but they don't take care of the complete uh, well-being of the uh, employee, for example, in identifying talent, equating talent, or some other tools that engage the talent aspect. So here we have brought this session for all of you today so that we get some answers to our questions to our eminent panelists who have brought you in today for this session. We just introduce our speakers to you. Our session is being moderated by Mr. Pramod Kumar Gupta, who is the General Manager HR at TechScorp Limited. He has got a 30 years of corporate experience and is a certified trainer as a diploma in training and development from ISTD, New Delhi, to his credit. He is also a science graduate MBA in HR in Masters of Social Work and a university topper. He is also an LLB and diploma in business administration. He has been a visiting faculty to many of the institutes to guide the MBA with uh, students. For example, institutes like IIT Gaziabad, JIPS, uh, Kalkaji, uh, Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan, Hindu Vidya Peach, IGNU, etc. So he has a lifetime membership of National HRD Network Delhi Chapter and Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. Pramod Gupta, to our session. Next, we have Ms. Jayan Roy as our eminent speaker for the session today. She is Director of Human Resources at Barco. Jayati is experienced human resource and change management specialist with over 20 years of experience across highly complex business and activities. She is also very passionate about CSR and sustaining initiatives in the organizations and actively participates in this space. Prior to joining Barco, Jayati was the group head HRD and at NDTV, where she owned the people agenda for NDTV and has done many initiatives there. We welcome you, Jayati, to our session.
next we have mr supreet singh sorry supreet swarn sandhu as our speaker he is the head human resources at it sorry it delight he is a young and seasoned hr leader with over 14 years of progressive experience in various gamuts of human resource and diverse sectors like automobile uh, e-commerce consulting and sales one of the youngest ever hr leader in india he took charge of the first managerial position at the age of 23 global leadership position for a consulting firm at the age of 27 and the hr head of a larger unicorn under the age of 30 facilitated by the business world as one of the top 100 professionals and leaders under 40 in 2018 His also expertise lies in diversifying strategies for making and developing cool workplaces. Besides that, he is also a fitness enthusiast. He is a certified fitness and nutrition coach, ex singer of a band, trained Latin American ballroom dancer, and an energy healer who focuses at a lot of speakers management health. So one of the dynamic speakers of our today. Most welcome. Next, we have Mr. Weber Mehta, who is the Global Director of Human Resources at Consus Global. Mr. Gupta, uh, Mr. Mehta has 15 years of experience in human resources and holds experience in various functions, be it business partnering, strategy, L&D, succession planning, anything of the HR gamut. He has also worked with organizations like Synergy Consulting, uh, EY, and uh, To name a few, he is also an IIM Calcutta uh, postgraduate in MBA and uh, a Delhi University student. So we welcome Mr. Mehta. Well, and over to Mr. Gupta, take it on. Well, my friends, my learned speakers, as Bhail has said. That uh, today's topic is HR challenges in hiring and retaining talent in the digital era. So we all, as HR professionals, we know that hiring and retaining employees are the two primary HR functions. In this digital era, many companies have shifted to work from home and work from anywhere kind of concept, and Some of the companies are in the hybrid mode, where around 25% of the employees are working from office, and around 75% of the employees are working from home. So, in such a scenario, the deliverables become very important. It is not the time spent on the job, but we actually deliver. What the employees actually deliver becomes all the more important. And in the post-pandemic area era, uh, the health and wellness of employees has assumed a lot of significance. And uh, many times we don't get the required skills of in the employees. So multi-skilling is another area which has become important. Managing teams and time both are important because when the employees are working from their homes. Time management becomes a difficult task. That all the bosses are able to take uh, uh, job complete functions in time. That becomes a challenge. Uh, in a way, COVID has also been a blessing in disguise because it has made us think out of the box. In this digital era, we can recruit from the entire world. It's not only the Indian scenario. We can recruit from anywhere. Campus hiring has reduced a little bit. Creation of internal talent pool is also advisable to meet the talent requirements. So this is, you know, in brief, the context setting that I was doing that in in the post and pandemic era, in the digital era. This is what the scenario looks like. So we would 
like to have the panel's views on the various uh, aspects of this uh, situation, which I'll uh, so I'll ask questions from all the panelists, and I'll request them to give their views on the same. First of all, I would like to pose a question to Mr. Gaber. Thank you. As to what best practices are being followed by your company to attract competition? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Gupta, what, what we are currently doing, uh, while we have not discounted the primitive ways of hiring through job portals and through consulting, uh, we have now moved on to hire people uh, through social media channels, which I think is also becoming a very common norm these days. But a very good feature which is there on platforms like LinkedIn that people can actually have a badge around their profile saying that they are open to work. So it's it's uh, it's very clear that these these uh, these are all active job seekers, and uh, they are open in the market. Their current organizations are also aware about this thing because if they are publicly uh, claiming that they are open for a new job, so it makes us very clear that these are serious job seekers. That's one thing uh, which is a very uh, very extensive. Uh, source channel that we are using. The another one is uh, given all the offer dropout ratios these days and having multiple offers in hand by almost all the candidates, uh, hiring through employee referral channel. Uh, whenever you have a new joiner, you know that their friends must be chasing them that, hey, uh, can I also get a job in your company and please do refer me. So uh, every new joiner can lead to another four to five candidates uh, you know, who can be your prospective new joiners. Uh, apart from that, uh, it, it is also very important that uh, we look for candidates who are already either serving notice period or who has got notice period of less than, say, one month or maximum two months. Because in this current era, where, wherein every candidate has got multiple offers in hand, uh, you know, there is a high probability that people are shopping around keeping your offer in their pocket. So it is always good to have candidates who've got lesser notice period to serve. The risk is definitely less. I'm not saying it's completely gone, but the chances of that, of such people joining your organization is higher than someone who's actually supposed to serve three months of notice period at all. Now, uh, the another problem which is coming these days is after you've made an offer that how do we ensure that these people are joining the organization? Uh, again, there is no magic wand around it. There is no thumb rule around it, but there are ways how we can engage with these candidates. Uh, keep sending them across uh, some questionnaires. Uh, you know, how was the interview process? Uh, you know, is there any suggestion from your side uh, to improvise a recruitment process? Are there any references? Uh, in between, don't ask them to send across all their documents like previous uh, employers, pay slaves, education certificates, passport, etc. But engage them, like ask them to send it on a weekly basis, you know, just call them up every week, say that, hey, can we get your education certificates? Hey, can, can we now get your past employer certificates? You'll get to know the pulse of the candidate, whether this person is serious or not. Last but not the least, uh, all organizations have got some sort of media collaterals for them, uh, designed for them. So keep sending them the write-ups, some reading material, ask them how did they like it, you know, uh, what, what did they learn from, from those documents about the organization. So these are few ways, few techniques through which you can stay in touch with the candidates than just getting surprised probably one day before or maybe on the day of uh, uh, joining that, uh, you know, there is some X, Y, Z reason the person is not joining. Uh, these are few things which I'm personally following, uh, you know, that, that's, that's it from my side on this question. Thank you. So uh, we have an interesting situation, right? As an organization, we are very diverse. So right from manufacturing to sales and marketing to uh, we get into a software speed. Now challenges are different and solutions are different for different teams. We can't have one solution. Um, a little bit different from a software perspective from what you said, you know, uh, Interestingly, we've actually enhanced our campus campus. So we've started going into campus a lot more, and I know a couple of other organizations have been doing so. Two reasons. One, of course, there's ready talent, at least you know, there's talent pool which can come and join. Uh, campus candidates' quality and the uh, interest of picking up new skills and trying to upskill themselves also helps. 
So that's one strategy that we have, of course, gone. Instead of saying we will only hire, say, a five year plus experienced person, like we did earlier, because we are a product organization. So that's one thing from a hiring standpoint. Now, if I look at it uh, from a three dimensional thing, you know, how do you attract talent? So, a lot more activity around branding. Because uh, earlier you would still have, you know, recruitment partners who would share across resumes and the positions would get filled or your website would do. But if you look at the categories like your sales and marketing professionals, for example, they need to know who you are, why you're there, what you're doing, why should they join? So uh, what we wouldn't have done as a work on employer branding and uh, sharing your EVPs, that's something that we are increasingly following so that People know who you are, people understand what you do, and then they are willing to come across. Uh, that's on the track uh, take. Um, the interview process has been shortened, uh, of course, because the shelf life, if I can call it like a product, you know, uh, of candidates is very low. Uh, if, if you keep a candidate hanging for about three weeks, the person is gone. So within getting the person's resume to ensuring there is a closure, it's about a week that we try and stick to, unless of course there are exigencies. So keeping the interview process uh, crisper and shorter, I think that's another um, great way of generating candidate experience. So there's a lot of focus on uh, candidate experience and employee experience that comes. Uh, also like we have a, a lot of stress on employee referral because uh, two things, right? Like, you know how engaged your existing folks are, and of course, you're sure at least this guy's going to join because uh, the story is common. You don't have people join here the last minute. So, so, you want to enhance that. Therefore, using that channel and leveraging it to the max that we can. Uh, and of course, a lot of post offer engagement activities. Um, to the extent, uh, you know, trying and doing a lot of those hiring manager calls and in, uh, for us doing individual calls and sweeping the sources as well. Because that's when you start getting the feelers. If the person is not picking up your call two to three times, you know there's something wrong and you start looking at a backup. Instead of waiting like a sick, sitting duck and, okay, now the person is not turned out. So I guess a lot of telltale signs uh, that we get through the post uh, offer engagement uh, does show up. And of course, that's also another way of creating a better experience because they start seeing okay you're engaged you know what you're doing so those are uh, a few activities that we do in the entire campaign thank you Jerry. now i would like to so i think uh, adding on to what uh, pepper and jerry spoke about i think uh, i come from an organization that is at the average age of the people is about 28 right and 40 percent women Right, so we are really, really proud of that factor. And I think what a candidate would look at, other than you know, uh, the methods that the traditional methods that are taking conventional touches, if I were to put it up this way, uh, is the fact around how uniquely you're placing yourself in front of them. That is very important. Compensation is one driver that is there. Right, in the last two years, if you see, there were pink slips given to people, businesses shut down, people were on salary cuts for a long, longer time, the savings were burned forever. What they're looking at right now is just not only compensation, primarily it's a driver. If you just go and search on the platforms, you'll come across that, you know, compensation is the driver for a lot of people. And I think most of the, uh, you know, HR professionals and non-HR professionals as well as job seekers, you would also agree with me on this factor. So I think uh, one part that, uh, that we are looking at here is to how uniquely we are placing ourselves in front of them. What is, as Jerry said, that I'll take instance from there, that what is that employee value proposition we're bringing up? how effectively they are changing our EVPs, right? They can't be age old. They have to meet the market. They have to meet your own feasibility, right? I mean, can you deliver X or Y or not, right? I mean, those are one of the factors that can really help you in terms of placing a prospect employer of a choice in front of somebody because the choices aren't lesser. There are organizations, you know, popping in, there are startups coming in, there are larger organizations, you know, merging, acquiring different businesses. So the opportunity of talent is not lesser. At the same time, the demand supply of the organization is also not there. So there's always an opportunity cost that always, you know, people have or all of us have. But at the end of the day, if you look at it, it's just about how you uniquely present yourself in front of the, you know, front of your candidates, your leadership, the kind of businesses that you're doing. How have you shaped yourself in the last couple of two or three years, right? Maybe the age of the organization also comes in the picture. And at the same time, how you have placed yourself as one interesting synergized, homogenized employer in front of that prospect candidate who has 
thousands of jobs available, why or you know how he or she should be choosing your employer. I think that's where everyone has to think through, and that's what we are thinking through in that direction. So we've created the EVPs, we've created the prospects, uh, you know, uh, in terms of engaging the employees. And to, to my surprise, I think we don't have a lot of you know higher energy rate, right? That's what we were offline talking a while ago. Right, so we don't have very high energy rate. Right, eventually, how we have been able to do it's to pulse check the candidate, what drives the employee, or what drives that particular candidate, and we present ourselves that way to that candidate. So it's that tailor made and customized these days. And I think for the next one or two years, you can definitely expect this to happen because people are trying to win cash, the opportunity that they lost in the last two years from now. So everything has to be tailor made. It can't be one size fit all. Right, so it could be the changing the way you come forward or present yourself to in front of an engineer. Versus an HR professional you're interviewing, versus a sales guy, versus a digital marketing guy, versus a brand marketing guy, for that matter, it's absolutely different, right? So maybe your, uh, you know, engineer guy may not be interested to know the numbers primarily, but they wanted to know what swanky technologies you're going to work on, right? Visit your brand marketing guy would like to understand how how have really grown as a brand, where is the story, right? Versus then your sales guy will say, okay, tell me the revenue, what kind of things that you generate, right? So I think this is how customized it should be. And that's what the I would not say we have reached that you know tip of the iceberg for now, but I think that's the direction we have taken and getting good results out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think the points which have come up in this uh, the best practices to be followed for employees to for attracting employees, like weekly follow up with the employee, prospective candidates which are going to hire before he joins. If you're in touch, in touch with the employee, uh, with the candidate before he joins, on a weekly basis, the chances of his joining become more. That's a very good practice. And then as Supreet said, that tailor making your uh, policy or EVP, system EVP, yeah. to fit the employee, yeah. that can also help in attracting the right talent. And like Jayati said, that uh, uh, it is different from sales and marketing people, different from this category of employees. So I think these are very valuable inputs. Thank you very much. So I'll moving on to the second question. Uh, I ask from Mr. Supreme that you know how do you build your brand? Uh, or, or how, how do you strengthen your brand so that the prospective employees, the candidates are attracted towards your company? Okay. So I think that's one very important thing that I think is important. So we look at two ways, consistency and homogeneity, right? So that's one. How you focus on business branding versus people branding. That is another. Couple of practices uh, that I can of course talk about you know, towards the end. But I think one thing we need, or a couple of things we need to keep in mind, one thing out of which is what is the story that you're trying to communicate? How synergized is the messaging clear? Do you really know what you want to communicate to people? There are numerous platforms available these days that everyone can leverage. Some of them are free, of course. Some of them are paid, of course. Right? But do you even know what message you want to communicate? So that messaging has to be very, very clear. It has to be consistent. Right? It has to really meet the kind of need that people have in the market these days, like I just spoke a while ago. Right? <laughs> Third part of it is that each person in your organization has that power to be an influential storyteller. You just don't need a lot of brand ambassadors per se, right? Most of the firms that we are a part of, we don't really have those celebrity brand ambassadors, let's say. But that doesn't mean people don't join us. But how uniquely we can plan it or how differently we can make it is the fact that how you leverage your own people to brand themselves, A, okay? giving them the opportunity, right kind of training and awareness, how they can actually brand themselves and become a, uh, an ambassador for ourselves. Because people, as I said a while ago, it's all digital era. Yeah, People search everything online for anything and everything. I'm sorry to say that for even finding a partner for yourself, you go online these days. That kind of comparison you do. It's about a job, right? So it's even more. The risk is even higher. I'm not saying the risk over there is not higher. It's there, right? But the risk is equally higher if I were to put it up this way. So I think that one part is very important, how you leverage your own individuals, your own teams, your own people, your own leadership to give away that message. One such practice that uh, we are, you know, I launched in the organization is what we do, what, we try and cover one employee or one citizen is what we call not employees in the system, 
on social media platform. We ask them some quirky questions to them, put it up on social media, let people comment, let people like. So it's, a, it's nothing but that dopamine level effect that you get somebody's appreciating you these days. Because that's another problem people say that in the hybrid world, I don't get appreciated. I don't have a face time, so I don't even know people say that you're looking good today or you think, well, okay, fine. You've done this, you've done that. So people don't have that kind of appreciation factor coming into picture. So we've learned that factor. If you can put up, put up your, you know, open up a LinkedIn right now, search it, hashtag IT star, ITI star, you know, S-T-A-R-S, you'll come across so many posts done by my team. And that's what we are doing, which if let's say if you get, let's say, covered or featured by us, it's a great kind of feeling that you will have. Listen, I've been featured and you'll share it across to multiple platforms. And that talks about volumes about the kind of culture you want to foster. So I think that's one factor. This is not conventional social media or let's say, you know, uh, general Facebook or, it li or sorry, Facebook or let's say LinkedIn kind of branding that we do. But I didn't like this is what we do, right? If I, if I were to answer that, that is different, unique from the other conventional practices that are there, right? Let's not say that we don't follow conventional things. But on top of it is what we do. And last but not the least, I think we also need to understand that these days, everywhere you have apps available wherein people can go and check about the organization, right? Whether it's Glassdoor, you have Ambition Walk, there is a new thing coming in called Fishbowl, right? One thing I just came across, we were talking offline called Zigup. There is an application where people just go and talk about the offer and the culture there, wherever they're joining. And people just come forward and start asking, refer me and make me join there. So that's the kind of ecosystem we are in. In that point, how you present yourself as a brand, how you present yourself, what you're giving it to your people, to your business. I think that philosophy is something that we need to really focus as business and HR leaders. And that's one thing of your practices that has focused what we are doing in the current organization. Great. Thank you. This is great. I think what is important is, I think, as you're rightly saying, that storytelling, you know, how you build your story or your company's story into the your website or into your you know, branding, that, that conveys the meaning or people have to understand it or relate it better so that, you know, they, they find it a useful company yeah. to join. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Yeah. So, coming to Mr. Vaibhav again. Yes, sir. Yeah, I would like to know about what strategy are you using to attract and retain employees? Okay, uh, so to retain employees, uh, I think we all know monetary aspect is the best aspect. That is, I, I don't have to talk about it anymore. Uh, we all know that's the driving force. But having said that, one of the other things that we can do is, uh, you know, especially the, the young blood or probably the fresh breed that is coming to the organization, uh, while they are testing the waters, it is, you know, one thing that attracts them is how are they getting cross-skilled and upskilled, right? So they they are, they are very fragile when it comes to uh, stability and hence they, they really want to see that what value add are they getting outside the monetical aspect, uh, whether they should be staying with the organization or not. So uh, it is very important that you keep them engaged, not to just those celebratory uh, aspects or uh, having some events in the organization, but some sort of serious business like uh, getting them trained, letting them work for a different team, giving them opportunities to get cross-skilled for working for a business, a different business function. Uh, this way they'll feel that fine, we are getting something, you know, while I'm learning, I'm also learning, right? So that that's one aspect. Apart from that, uh, one very cool thing that started happening around two, two years back when this whole pandemic hit us that there were some, some sort of pen down days coming up in the organization that suddenly the company announces that, hey, this Friday none of us are working, no meetings, no calls, uh, you know, just fence down, just relax, have a long weekend, spend time with your family, kids, do whatever you want to do. Uh, you know, these, these are some, some elements, you know, which, which triggers the happiness quotient in, in employees that, wow, suddenly we, we have one extra day off in, in in, in our working life. Uh, now when the world has opened up again, travel has opened up again, uh, you know, clients have started uh, moving from virtual meetings to face-to-face -face meetings, uh, and people have been sick and tired of working from home. It is good to give them opportunities to go on the client side and work overseas if, if companies uh, have that, that sort of flexibilities. Give them international opportunities, let them work outside of India, let them go and uh, sit at the client side for 15, 20 days, forever, so short to a midterm period. And, uh, you know, this will actually uh, excite them once again that, hey, while we are also going out of home, uh, we are also visiting a different country or maybe we are working in a different environment now. That's another one. Uh, do less of micromanagement. 
uh, you know, while people are working from home, I know there have been organizations who are making, uh, turning on the videos on the video, con uh, video conference called mandatory, uh, you know, actually checking whether the person is working or not working. So uh, I think it should be more deliverable focused than actually saying that what this person is doing at 11 in the morning or four in the afternoon, you know, it's, it, it is all about whether the person is delivering the work. So less of micromanagement is one. Uh, and uh, if you want to call back uh, employees to your office, and if you want to have this gradual change in their work environment, start with a very lighter note, let, let them come all together on a day when you're organizing a lunch for the entire team, let them go out because all of them are meeting each other in person uh, after, after a lot of months or maybe in some companies even years. So, uh, and they have now got into a comfort of just working in their you know, home environment, taking things easy and lazy. So if you really want to call them, call them to office, send them out for lunch, uh, let the team celebrate the coming back together. Once again, uh, new people must have joined in the organization in the same team. They don't know each other face value. Nothing is there as of now. So uh, keep them happy, keep them engaged, uh, keep business in mind, keep training them, send them to client sites, spend some money, of course, uh, having some, some sort of lunches and evening parties organized for, the, for that particular team which is coming back. And yes, uh, uh, people don't like to be getting micromanaged. They have ample opportunities outside uh, the current organization. So if you're actually bugging them, uh, you're not retaining them. You're just burning them more. That, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. I think Chris, you have raised a very important point. Like, I think it is very important not to do micromanagement. Because the more you closely destroy the employees, the less they their results of their outcome become less because Absolutely. of micromanaging them. So let them perform, let give them freedom to work. This is one important area. And another important area is that you give them training. Yeah. Develop them. Help employees in developing them so that they are, you know, they feel they have been uh, uh, they are acquiring new skills. Absolutely. They are becoming better employees, they are becoming uh, better skilled. Then also send them out, saying that you know, even if it's this may be sprints of time, let the employees move out, travel yeah. outside, and get exposed to different environments so that they can develop. So the more it is employee focused and less control, controlling is less, so they become more productive. Very important. Thank you, Zaiba. Hi. <clears throat> Moving on to Jazzy Ma'am. I would like to know <coughs> that in this kind of scenario, when work from home and uh, you know, work from anywhere and these kind of things are there, how do you build a leadership pipeline? How do you create leaders? Yeah. Uh, that along with multi generation, right? That's that's working yeah. in the same long place. So I, I think there yeah. are there are two challenges that yes. we face. Um, you know, uh, firstly, if I if I just step back into a little bit of a multi-generation story and then I'll come into hybrid story as well. Hybrid has been on top of everybody's mind. So uh, if I'm, I'm just quoting from my home and I'm sure that's the same situation in a lot of our houses. So I have my mother with us who is a uh, different generation. And if you look at workplaces, we have five generations, four generations at least in a lot of workplaces. Yours doesn't, but in a lot of places. <laughs> Uh, but like we have a mother, I have my son, uh, and then there is me and my spouse, right? So um, we have very traditionally, if you look at it, uh, all traditional rituals, all of that, mother is the guiding force. Uh, if you correspondingly look back at the organization, uh, your domain knowledge, understanding, uh, policies, ways of working, uh, a certain senior generation would have that knowledge again. <laughs> it's often perceived that the, that the young uh, school going kid who's now uh, going to be a teenager is more tech savvy. So every time one of us is stuck, he's there uh, and you know, manages to finish it within a second and picking up uh, ASP cues from one and put it to the other, it's very easy. But what is interesting to see is how these two generations interact. So we can't label them as this is the tech generation and this is the non tech generation. When the two interact, you can actually see what we call the concept of mentoring and reverse mentoring happening. Uh, you know, there are a lot of times uh, 
the grandmother is actually picking up technology skills from the grandson and then passing that a lot more skills to the grandson as well. So there is mentoring and reverse mentoring. And that's a concept which we often bring into the workplace as well. Uh, so when we look at leadership, leadership today is not defined by a role. It is also by roles that you play at different places. Particularly within a, a software framework, you know, while you do have a people manager or a leader, in fact, we don't use the word manager in our organization. So we do have leaders, but we also have roles like scrum masters, which are so-called facilitators in the process. So those are people who work to influence, and that's where these concepts of, you know, how do you manage through networks, how do you manage through mentoring, how do you pick up skills, uh, that concept. Of course, the biggest challenge that your people leaders today face, uh, you know, is how do you manage the hybrid work situation, as you had rightly asked. Um, it's difficult when you don't even know how the person is reacting, what the person's body language is, and you're trying to give feedback. So uh, there was an episode when a people manager was giving direct feedback to an employee who was a wife standing behind. And you know, uh, that can become a very uncomfortable situation for the employee, for the manager, and for the family. So these are tricky moments and therefore, uh, you know, it's important in how do you identify who can be a leader uh, and then build those, build on those EQ skills, uh, build on those, uh, you know, very fine, refined skills that you can and judgment calls that you should take from them. So it's important not to just go by saying, okay, you need to have X number of years of experience before you can become a leader, but also to see uh, where are you within your whole empathy spectrum? Are you somebody who played this role in the past and mature enough to be handling this? Within our organization, we have teams where we have very young people who become leaders because that's a team which is coming into office very regularly, bonding with each other, and they're able to handle it. But there are teams which have, uh, you know, people across the generations which have very strong uh, pillars who are senior enough and young hybrid uh, folks as well who just joined from college, like I said, who've been handling uh, campaigns. Now, these teams typically would need more mature folks, preferably people who come from within uh, the team itself. So you definitely don't want to hire somebody from outside and young. That's another thing. So how do you have ingrown talent becoming one of them? Because this person would then know the family situation, this person would know on a one-on-one -on -one connect, and you know, it, it can build an informal network. So, Two cases where you can hire from out and where you can build from within, that's important. How do you uh, always keep uh, somebody from a succession pipeline going back? So, uh, it, it can't be that a leadership position is vacant for too long. So ensuring that there is a succession uh, pipeline created within the organization, that's something that helps. And that has helped in traditional places, more so in hybrid because you know, at least in traditional places, people were coming into the organization, somebody or the other was attending to them. When you're not, when half your talent is in office and half is in, if there is no, uh, you know, what we typically call in India, Sutradhar to this uh, thing, then it's difficult for them to sort of manage this. Um, or, you know, for you to get into the productivity metrics, see what is cracking up, who's becoming a loose spiral, who's too much attending to loose. So those are basic feelers that a person can now or needs to now actually pick up. So uh, it's important that a succession pipeline keeps ready at all stages so that the position doesn't change vacant for it. So I think that those are a couple of things that we've focused on very consciously in terms of how do you build a, a leadership pipeline, where do you buy a leadership pipeline, so which things can you really hire from outside. Um, of course, the last but most important thing we've tried to ensure is we don't want only managers because there was a time when there were people who were technical folks and there were people who were managers. Uh, right now we are saying managers really need to be hands-on. So if needed, you will roll up the sleeves and actually start building. Uh, and that's the group of people who really command a lot of respect from within the team. Because they, you know, the teams need to have people who know what they're talking, the language that they're speaking, the challenges that they're actually facing in the work and not, you know, trying to tell them, you know, this is the way you need to work and I'm resource planning. They don't need resource plans. There are enough tools and technologies which does resource planning. So I think there's a couple of changes that we are seeing with the hybrid way of working. Um, and, uh, you know, the areas that we need to focus on, which is become very different from what it used to be. So 
don't hire just for skill, but hire for empathy, hire for the basic human values in the world. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you very much. Sir. Points you have raised, like I think uh, reverse mentoring is very important in a multi generational workplace, wherein the, the elders, senior employees, they learn from the new entrants, as the, as the example that you gave of the family. You know, the grandmother teaches something for the grandchild, and the grandchild also teaches that you know, the elders are not all. My companies are working with. My boss used to tell me, I have to put it on the A leader, he says, he was told that this team, this team, this team, this big pads are mine, and the big pads are yours. Whenever you get applauded for something, you give credit to the team. And when you get a bad name, you take it on yourself. Don't pass it on to the team. So I think uh, this is a very, very important point you have raised on reverse mentoring. And also you talk about succession planning. That is also very important. That you can look for leaders, prospective leaders, build them, train them, instead of hiring from outside. I think leadership from within is more important and more useful to the organization than hiring leaders from outside. Thank you, Jay. Okay, now coming to Mr. Supreme, uh, I think for retaining and uh, retaining employees, especially, you have to redesign your HR policies in the context of uh, the new ecosystem. Would like to have this view from you? Sure. Um, I think uh, from a standpoint of uh, policies or procedures or Governance mechanisms, the workflows in an organization. I think one thing is very important your business manifesto has to marry your HR manifesto. I think a lot of organizations aren't able to create that kind of association between the two. I mean, you can't have your majority of the focus, and typically I'm talking about the you know, top layer of the organization, which is only, only business focus. Right? If you work, if you create a business manifesto in silos, the people manifesto will be haywire forever. Right? So I think that's one part that organizations who have started going to X, 3X, 5X, 10X have also seen, depending on the businesses they are in, and their organization picking up as well. So I think that's important. One part of it from a culture standpoint, as an HR leader or a business leader or anyone who's contributing in the organization, how you're ensuring that your business is marrying with the HR practices or HR manifesto or people manifesto, is what you want to talk about. I think that's one important. I think Jaiti uh, raised a very interesting point here, which is about buying and building talent. I think that plays a very important role because you have to understand how you're going to grow in a year, in a year, and what are the kind of possible problems that you are carrying forward from the last year, and what are the anticipations we have for this particular year, and that's where the HR comes into picture, right? To solve it, sometimes you know with empathy, as we said, if I take influence, sometimes with some tools, sometimes with people. Let's be very clear. I think all of us would kind of agree that in organizations, every problem somewhere down the line is a people problem, right? Either has to be answered by people, to be created to by the people, or created by people for that matter. So I think what we need to also see from a culture perspective that are we ready enough to take that hybrid way of working when you say that? I think I would say a, a, a combo way of working to have your conventional practices topped up with some tools and then ensuring that your business problems are being addressed along with the people issue and then there are you know they're pairing and then that's how you're you know, growing the business together that's one second i think uh, with this growing era you need to be very open and allowing people to speak up right when i say speak up ask them why is it why is it why don't you allow your people to go back and question why do you have this policy why don't you go into this business how many organizations do we see allowing people to do so? We did it in the past, and we even uh, you know, got the of the response that I will not judge at all. Somebody said that I have this, you know, this, this irritating orange wall in front of me. Why do we have orange wall in front of us? Why do we have a yellow wall in front of us? From that, 
simplest of the question to a larger thing, why don't we venture into this business? Why don't we have this policy? And I think taking inference from this point is my third point, which is making your organization whilst you need outputs, but have you ever questioned or introspected that you really have right inputs? Have we explored all the avenues to get the inputs from people? That may be putting you for success as a leader. That will put your department as a success as a team and the organization as success as a whole. So I think whilst it is important to chase targets, which are the outputs, but important for you to question, do we really have the right inputs taken from everywhere or not? Fourth point here I would like to make, uh, which is around, I think, ensuring you have open channel of communication, right? Uh, I mean, there are numerous HR policies. Those are governances. Some of them are perks. Some of them are benefits. I think most of the firms are doing that. I think what comes into my mind right now is to also focus on how you create that communication loop and close that loop. How often your leaders go and just have a 15 minute interaction just to check on the people as to how they are doing. What are their personal wins? Have you been able to reach that level of that's what your talent needs, irrespective of the age, you know, generation, role, location. These are all these things agnostic. Right? And last but not least, what I feel here, I think we have to strike a balance between natural intelligence whilst we run after artificial intelligence always. Right? Um, I'm sure most of you would agree with me is the fact that people now create their CVs to match that chatbot or, uh, or, or an automated screening mechanism available to at least get their CV through. Right? Whilst you see the hit rates are increasing and everything, but you really need an artificial, I mean, of course you need an artificial intelligence to take it up, but you really need a human mind and eyes to really sail through what is behind, I would say, what's the why of the what, I mean, or how of the what. I mentioned what, but do I really know? So I think we need to strike that, you know, uh, balance, not to make it too chatbot driven, because anyway, that is super transactional, but where is the human touch? Where are the HR business partners? Where are we, where, what are the roles they are playing in terms of ensuring that there is a strong communication too, or communication gap being, you know, closed. People are into instant gratifications these days, yeah, right? 30 minutes may be designed, then two minutes may I have a doctor in front of me, catering to me, I don't have to run after the hospital or the restaurants. That's the need of people. So if you cater to it, your culture automatically comes into picture and believe me, there are companies, there are organizations where you have culture within cultures. And those are the biggest toxins. I'm sorry for the lack of a better word I'm using here, but those, that's the biggest toxin. And policies, practices, there are numerous banks available, right? Wherein you can go, you know, just please talk about that. You know, we have, you know, HR success toxins that in themselves has so much of things. You post something, you get so many response, but you have to also see that does that really marry my culture? So if I've answered these, these are high genes. We say these are very basic, but these are high genes. Increasing and growing further as we proceed to a, a you know, to a different generations working together from different locations with different roles and has an appetite to ensure that, or a question perhaps, that am I able to succeed in my role in the organization? Oh, that was great. Most important that I found uh, was that communication part. In any organization, if the communication is happening well and in the right manner, if you are able to say the right thing at the right time to the right person, most of your problems are solved. Communication is very important. And then another important that you uh, point you raised was that the HR and business have to be aligned with each other. Because HR is for business. If the business is not growing and HR is growing, there is no meaning. Absolutely. So HR and business have to be aligned. And, and questioning is very important. It's very important that if we, if we don't question, and then if you don't question, you don't grow. I think there's something that, you know, just struck my mind when you just said this. Uh, this is something which we are not taught ever. Just to go back to your houses, if somebody comes in and questions, so why are you asking me this? We yeah. don't allow people, it's a skill that should come from the house. That's, I think, a socialization that's that comes from the house, right? And that's when people aren't comfortable opening their mouth and asking someone because they'll say, I don't know, I'll be judged, I'll be asked uh, questions, or I may be, you know, have, people will have different perceptions about me. So I think that's something which also comes from the house. Yeah. Yeah. 
don't like questions, you don't ask questions, and you don't like people to ask questions. Ask questions. So I think this basic philosophy has to change. Yeah. So which is going to help the organization as well as the society. So it's both ways. Okay. So moving on to now the retention strategy, strategies and techniques. I would like to start with Jayati Madam to talk about what retention techniques and policies you are using in your organization. So obviously we, we are also no, uh, we are also getting into this baptism by fire, right? So every time we try something and then we see if it works or doesn't work. I think one thing that has really worked is uh, the culture and who is speaking about it. So, um, and I still fundamentally think that's your first thing that will help the people retain. They don't just stay for money, they stay for much larger. So what is the culture of the organization? Will this culture, again borrowing from you, is this culture going to make me employable uh, or is it just going to keep me employed here? So is there a learning system around it? Uh, we are actually focused on a lot of these software aspects as an organization. So ensuring that your upskilling is happening, ensuring that your uh, you know value in the overall job market does not diminish because of you. So I am not going to get somebody to work on, you know, nothing bad against it, but if somebody is perpetually working on a mainframe, then the person will not work for me, right? Because he or she would want to work in the cloud space. So how do you ensure that you're constantly upskilling and upgrading? That's the second aspect. So like I said, first is culture. Is there open communication? Am I being heard? Um, the third thing is the experience that we a lot of people got during the COVID days. That was the testing of waters because um, if the organization has not really lived up to its culture statements or value statements or whatever you might want to call it, and has um, you know sort of behaved differently during COVID, there has been an apprehension in minds of people to think is this the best place that I want to stick around. And that's where, you know, uh, we had the GPDW survey, which talks about the trust index or anything else. So those start showing up and that, of course, then translates into attrition. So how do you ensure that you walk the talk in a lot of these uh, things that you do about employee well-being, healthcare, uh, smaller benefits, but larger impact now, uh, things around parent insurance, individual insurance. These are not very important. But today, when somebody comes and joins us, these are factors that are starting playing up in the minds of even when they're looking at offers this way. Of course, these, and then there are monetary and non-monetary pieces that you want to try and do and look at, uh, you know, when you take care of compensation, who are the critical skills, which is the high potential, whom would you want to reward more than the other? So how do you con constantly and continuously differentiate performance? So that's another thing that we uh, are, of course, as an organization. Industry. Um, we don't do as much, but of course, a lot of companies are increasingly focusing on retention uh, bonuses and stock options. So, those are again very strong retention tools that are being used across uh, from trying to both ring fence and keeping them. And the bonuses are very interesting, right? So, I pay you something, and then that has a clawback period of a year, and then I pay you something, and that has a clawback period of a year. So, so you're almost stuck for about a period of a year. Okay. Uh, and by then, you would have grown into a much larger role. So, uh, the last piece that we focus on is a lot of individual career conversations. So, we do have an individual development plan, uh, very well crafted, where individual managers and the uh, person has that conversation about where I am today and where would I want to go. And then, uh, systematic development plans are put in place, where the person can actually look at how the career is going to be. So, uh, when that kind of investment is being made on a person, then that person automatically tends to stay. And again, all of this done, it's not a foolproof plan, right? The person who wants to leave needs to leave. But then you know you've done the best that you could. Okay. Uh, I can just add to what Nan said. Uh, cross scaling, I think we have already spoken about it a few times uh, during this discussion. Flexibility also is something which, you know, not that micromanagement, let them work from wherever and all those things. Uh, I think uh, we are all talking about very new techniques, you know, in the last two years and all, but I'm still an old school person and I still believe that the primitive ways were really good, you know. There was a concept, something called as internal job postings. Yeah. No one, these days, no one talk about those things, you know. I, I would love to work 
in some other team if that is an interesting work or an interesting team. So uh, internal job postings, etc. I don't know where it has been lost, but uh, that is one aspect which uh, the good guys, the good people who want to learn and grow within the organization, this is one thing which people would, would always want to do. And uh, apart from that, uh, uh, when, when we talk about change management, when we are bringing change, change in the organization, uh, again, old school thought, there used to be a concept of forming small committees within the organization that HR is planning to bring in a new change. Say, uh, we are trying to bring in a new leave policy or a new uh, office attendance policy. Why can't we form a small group of people, not just from HR and from the management, but from the operations side, from the business side, let them say, you know, uh, that we'll meet the minimum benchmarks, which are the, you know, rules and regulations by the government, uh, meeting the compliance. But what else do you want to see? Do you really want to have those concepts of sick leave, casual leave, earned leave, uh, some, some leaves getting carried forward, some getting encashed. Hey, why can't we just have one nomenclature? It's just leave, right? Don't categorize them. And, uh, you know, and you decide how many you think you can carry forward and all those things. Can you loan it? Can you give it uh, as a loan to one of your fellow employees? So, uh, inclusivity is what I'm trying to say. Uh, uh, involve uh, the business side of the people to form not all, but certain HR policies, right? Uh, be, uh, make them feel that they are included in the decision making. And, uh, you know, they should know that they have a say, uh, they can question. So a lot of things gets covered up. We are talking about questioning. We are talking about uh, giving, uh, you know, opportunities to speak up and all those things. Officially, formally form small committees. Let that committee take a decision. Of course, subject to approval from the management, but, you know, at least you will engage with employees. Uh, so these are some old techniques which I still like personally, uh, and this has always succeeded in pre-pandemic scenario. I'm assuming this will even succeed now. Uh, and apart from that, you know, send them on four sleeves. You've been working hard. You've been slogging. Hey, just take a seven days paid leave, and here are the vouchers. Here are the tickets, and all those things. Take your family along. So, I mean, there is no end to giving monetary benefits. Uh, but principally as HR, if you're looking at, uh, at me as an HR leader or any one of us here, uh, the old primitive ways will always have its own uh, charm in it. Is mm -hmm. all I can say. So th that, that's something beyond uh, the flexibility and the upskilling part that, that I want to bring. On the table. Thank you. Thank you, very much. you know, I, I'm reminded of a company I was working in Gazibar. So what they do? They had a lot of female employees. So, what they did was that they gave wool, you know, the sweater yeah. banana yeah. no, stitching wool. They gave those wool to a group of female employees and they made sweaters out of them for an orphanage. There was an orphanage. The girls and the ladies, they went to the orphanage, they took their measurements of the body measurements. And they made sweaters for specific children. And then on a particular day, like on a on a Christmas day or something like that, all of them went there and they gave them sweaters with their own hands. And they all the girls and ladies were crying on that day. And they felt so engaged, so attached to the organization that you know it's a different kind of bonding. So this is this, uh, these kind of activities earlier companies used to do. I don't know if all the feasible or not feasible. So, but I think in any case, the small activities, small committees that you're talking about. I was because I'm from this old school. I've seen uh, the small action groups, small yes. committees, cross-functional teams yes. being made even in quality circles of TQM activities Correct. there the cross functional teams were made to solve a particular problem and then when the problem gets solved they used to celebrate yeah. so they, they used to get the real uh, output uh, I remember in one of the uh, group one of the workers his suggestion was implemented in improving a machine of cement company so cement 
difference in Germany, they recognize their model as per the suggestion given by an employee, a uh, worker. So the, the engagement, the, the involvement, or the, uh, the skilling of the employees is, I think, uh, very important. And we can go a long way in retaining employees. And uh, I think the points that you have raised, like you know, company culture, upskilling, being heard, trust of the employees, walk the talk, which is very important. What you have been saying, what you have been saying, if they're actually doing it, because you know the policies, they say something else, but we actually do something else. So I think walking the talk is very important. An individual career plan. Work on individual employees yeah. and see that the employees go is from the work yeah. from there. So anybody who is taking care of the employee, the employer should continue to stick to us. And you know, in HR, in one of the conferences, uh, somebody was saying that HR has a function of tear bhi chalane aur parinde bhi bachane. So this is a, it's a popular function of uh, HR. Many times, you know, we are supposed to terminate and just you know, the person the actions are to be taken. So our logon is keep it chalane hote hain aur parinde bhi bachane. So that is a very critical function. Uh, this is uh, up to the intention in the sense that you know, sometimes we have to get rid of certain employees for many reasons. So that. That becomes a, a bad retention. Okay, now coming to Mr. Supreme. Yeah, please. Okay, um, I think traditionally speaking, uh, I think one part of what uh, Viper said, right, and a larger part of uh, what Jayanti said, I think topping it up with it, what is important for all of us to also look at. Is how your entire total rewards framework looks like, right? I quite framework driven guy, right? A uh, lot of people don't find the value of such things unless you tell them how it works, right? Otherwise, it just becomes a chapter in the MBA books. Yeah. So I think that way, uh, that ideology, right, right, uh, is what I really focus on. So I think wellness part these days this has come up very very strongly. There are places wherein wellness is is being rewarded. How organizations have transformed themselves when it comes to wellness. I'm being a wellness coach or fitness coach myself. It's very very close to my own heart. I think uh, we've developed our framework, keeping in mind two larger sets of wellnesses, which people have really focused and have not been able to focus in the last couple of years. One is the is is their financial wellness, right? And second is their emotional wellness. I think these are the two important parts which we really need to focus when you try and talk about how you are trying to retain people in the system. I mean, retention it comes with a lot of things, business stability, business growing or not. I think those keeping those uh, parts aside, I think one part of it is there. So a couple of things that we've done, uh, we've launched uh, something called uh, a very, very personalized and unique uh, COVID home care support program, uh, which can offer people a caregiver, uh, a dedicated doctor, a team for 10 days, they will disturb you. I mean, I mean, you'll get disturbed. I mean, they'll call you three times a day and ask, are you feeling well? I think that's the simplest thing anyone wants to know during this. How are you? That's something that people don't ask. There is one, one, one person came back and said that this much of thing, my girlfriend doesn't even call me this much. That it's a doctor or a caregiver called me, asked me numerous times, how am I doing? I think that's what the one success factor that we have had. Second of it, we've also, there is an ask, I would say it's a, it's a subconscious ask from a lot of uh, employees. If at all something happens to me, what my organization is going to help me with? Whilst we have insurances and everything at place, on top of it, what we have done is terms of, in terms of offering or ensuring that people, and that's a part of our cultural philosophy as well, that to ensure that in the time of unforeseen incident, that we are there to support the family. So we have some plans available for them, right? For the family as well, to ensure that there is a continuity uh, of not only the in, but also a touch, uh, a larger conscious touch to the organization. Then we've done something around uh, 
you know, offering a fast track growth plan to people. Uh, wherein there are about eight or nine unique job families that people can move uh, across 70 plus unique roles. Right, so people know how it would look like. And interestingly, in one last piece that we've done is the fact to remove that lens of looking at someone or deliverable or, or the, the ability to deliver or to influence the organization from a perspective of the number of years of experience somebody comes with, right? So I think that's one part we have, you know, we have really removed that whilst experience does matter to an extent, but for certain roles, we've really, really gone ahead and said that, you know, this is not really what we look at, but what is the kind of deliverable, what kind of impact you bring to the table? And we have live examples in the organization where people have taken up such larger roles, right? Despite not being, you know, uh, quote unquote experienced traditionally. So I think these are the things and practices that can really help you look at your entire talent landscape from a very different lens altogether because they know, they'll see what they know, right? And they'll know what they see. Yeah. So I think it's up to us what lens we bring to them, what they see it, where do they see it, and how do they see that? Yes, it's really, really touching my larger conscious or not. Because at the end of the day, culture, processes, philosophies, whilst they have some governance mechanism traditionally, but something has to touch or really really make you feel from a larger conscious that yes, this I am something I can resonate with a lot. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I have for the manufacturing side, I have spent a lot of uh, time with my career in manufacturing company. So what I found was that uh, so whenever there used to be accident in the factory, if an, if an employee is injured and he's not coming to the office, or to the machine, but say for a week's time, um, see the, everybody suffers. The organization suffers, the employee suffers, and the productivity also suffers. So, when they said you have rightly pointed out, is something which is directly proportional to the output of the organization. If an employee is down, whether it is COVID or other or any other yeah. reason, so employee wellness is definitely. Important. physical wellness as well as mental wellness along with of course we talk about uh, emotional and financial and wellness which is something to do with the company and as far as the employees are concerned the mental and physical health yeah. wellness of the employee is very important and the employer should take care of that for, for its own benefit the organization is going to uh, take advantage of it so it's going to be the beneficiary of the employees. So, thank you very much. Can we go for the QA? So, thank you, speakers. Thank you so much for your valuable views. So, I would like to ask the audience if any questions they have. Uh, so when we look at the the so-called the traditional apprentice program, uh, then that that is applicable for the factories. We still do that, but that's again very basic level. But if I look at the campus program, which is the other way of looking at apprentice program, we honestly started this about two years back, and. Uh, about 20% of our hiring numbers are coming through them. 20% of our hiring numbers are coming through them. Honestly, so far it's been an excellent uh, program for us. Of course, getting them in this year, again, not a large services organization where we have the bandwidth of having people come, be on the bench for six months and then pick up skills and move on. For a product organization, the challenge that we face is we need them to be productive day one. So ensuring how do you upskill them very fast and maintain their productivity level, that's the first thing. The second, of course, all of them want to work in the space of AI. So they start the interview process with AI ML, they come to you talking AI ML, and by the time you tell them, okay, now we have Python, they're still thinking, AI ML ka kya hua? So I think trying to get into that ambition match uh, is sometimes a challenge. But like I said, uh, there's so much of energy in them that if you can sort of channelize them and help them understand, 
uh, it basically needs and blocks time from some of your senior resources. That's one thing for sure. You would need somebody who's constantly guiding them, mentoring them, telling them uh, which way to go. But if you can do that, there's immense amount of energy and there's such a fast learning pace and so much hunger to do new things that it really pays off. So I think so I think what matters is the fact that you know a I mean wherever you are at this stage, keeping all the hypotheses in the mind. Um, I mean, do you have self-awareness? I think that's the first thing, right? And it is, I think, what stage or juncture of, you know, of a career I'm, I am, it's important for us to know the self-awareness. If I know what am I good at, I can go ahead and present my own blogs, I can write my own articles, I can share something that I like, which can have my own thoughts on it. So that's also part of a personal branding, right? For example, if I am interested, let's say, in, you know, uh, AI ML for that matter, right? So, so many of the articles around it, I have my own thoughts around it, who stops me to pick it up on LinkedIn and write it, right? But am I aware of it? Do I have the, uh, have I been told about the resources? Have I been told about, have I been, oh, you know, given that awareness that these are the things available to you and this is how you can leverage the platform. I think once these uh, politics and majorities of even don't know how to leverage LinkedIn at the optimum level till now, despite using it for ages, right? It's a constant, you know, or a consistent or a continuous learning and adapting the skill and adapting to that new way. And if that is told to somebody during the initial days of their career, which of course, the majority of us, was, it was not that we have self-acquired these things, right? So I think that can really pave way for them to, you know, be a personal brand ambassador, right? And then perhaps take up something else for them. I think, yes, that's important. I think we all need mentors at any given stage. You turn back, you would need one, I would need one, everybody would need one. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. A lot of people will hate me for that, but I only work, uh, I only learn working from office. So that's, uh, I think, as I said, I'm, I'm an old school guy in, in that term, you know, the, the quality of work that you can deliver from office is unmatchable, you know, and uh, unless and until there are some apprehensions in families and, you know, there are some reservations, some problems, etc. Uh, I mean, work from home uh, should be, uh, again, on a frugal basis, etc. But I think it's high time we move on from, uh, you know, the candidates tell me clearly that, hey, unless you're giving me a work from home option, I'm ready to join your company, otherwise not. And, and these are across all ages. So I don't understand what is their love towards work from home. Work from home. But personally, if you, you ask me a personal question, I like to work from office only. Uh, I think I, I'm at my best when I'm at my office. But that's how I look at it. Pickup was there. Then Pickup is actually an app that I came across on Instagram a couple of weeks ago, wherein a candidate can post that I have an offer from X organization paying me this much. And the other people will start asking them, refer me there. A lot of us who are unaware that that's the, that's the level of you know challenges coming in the tech hiring. 
right? When I came across, I was really astonished. Yeah, so that's one platform. Not that you share reviews, but it's about the ambition box is there, fishbowl is there, glass door is there. Yeah, yeah. fishbowl. I think, uh, largely speaking, you can't 100% believe on any platform. We all do online shopping before buying a product. We also see a review. Some people like the product. Some people did not like the product. That's how human beings are. There will be things I would like. There will be things I may not like. Taking inference from him, what he said that you know, uh, bhi marna hai or you know, birds ko bhi bazana hai, parinde bhi bazana hai, right? So I think a lot of people would would resonate with the things, a lot of people would not resonate with the things. So I think that's one part of it. Second part of it is the fact that it's, again, it's seeing half glass full or half glass empty. If that's a philosophy you foster in the organization that you all also have to look at the half glass full, which is the strengths, people keep thinking from that lens. If you have internal platforms, sufficient internal platforms available for people to quote unquote, with a lack of a better word, ranting, right? Then people may not go over there. People will only go to those platforms at once if they had the poorest or the poor experiences. One, second, people didn't hear things internally or did not close the loop for them. Right? Third, when you say that how people don't take efforts, I think if if we bring them or allow them to be a part of the journey to make a brand better and allow them to feel and resonate with the philosophies that we have, I think people automatically turn into that. Right? Whilst, as you said, the credibility or the, the accuracy of those platforms may not be 100%, but it does give you some picture. And with certain lens, we have to accept that there are people who would like things, there are people who would not like things. Largest to the top employers in the world, there are blogs wherein their exited employees have written why I left that X organization in one year. And that X organization is something that people look up to that, you know, as a right? So you'll find out that people have their own experiences, but how you manage that platform yourself, that is also important. If you give people sufficient platforms internally, they will not go out and rant. They'll rant on you, believe me, right? If they're an experience change, there are people I've seen where they have gone back and told us that this is from two, I rate you four. We have seen that kind of spike happening. And I think largely organizations also have to accept their own flaws, right? and bring that kind of lens to the picture, you know, to the people that listen, we also have to look at people's strength. I think majority of us as leaders, sometimes consciously, some, you know, subconsciously, we don't really focus on that. So if you do this, you may not have a lot of people going out over there and planting. It's just a psychology. I just need something to go in and write. I did not like this. Yeah. And I'm doing it on a platform or a survey link or whatever. I may not be that active on that platform. Again, if I'm taking a hypothesis, this is how I think. But there could be other ways as well, but that's how I really want to put it. Yes. So what we focus is that every six months, we want people to turn back and see what they have learned. Right? I think that's one important. In the initial stage of the career, what important for any fresh talent is to the kind of ample learning he or she gets. Long back, one of my mentors and coaches told me, right, that if you go out and try and coach other people, right, especially the fresh talent, right, they should always focus on the fact that the first two to three years is about learning. Money is important. Yeah, you don't sell your skills for free of cost, right? But what is the kind of learning path you get? The kind of people you're going to work with, that's important. The kind of leaders you're going to work with, right? The kind of platforms you're going to get. 
the kind of tangible things you can see how many people move from x role to y role in 6 months those are the things that really feel or makes a fresh talent to feel that yes i really resonate with this organization i want to join this other than compensation for sure absolutely, absolutely. So that's why if you go out and see the campuses, uh, there are companies who do that. You know, they are they are off tops, right? Organization tops, right? They do focus equally on the uh, culture, because when you go out in campuses, the compensation is open to all. People know that how much I'm being paid. But once you join the organization, that's where the race begins, right? And what drives you to sustain and fast track that race is the kind of culture and how you relate to that culture. It is the chicken and the egg actually. Yeah. Uh, if you wouldn't have lost this talent, you wouldn't have been in the battlefield of hiring the talent to replace the guy. So that's one. Uh, at times, uh, it depends. I, I, I know I'm saying diplomatically, it depends. It depends on the role that you're trying to hire for. So, for niche skills, uh, hiring becomes a bigger challenge. Uh, retaining is easier if you've done the right things already in the organization. If they've grown within the organization, retaining is relatively easier from that perspective. Um, but for mass skills, uh, you know, particularly for the so called hot selling skills, uh, retention and hiring are both equally challenged. Retention because, uh, you know, and, and you hate to see the tab open at both ends, right? And I think we were talking about it. Today. So you can't have people leaving them, leaving and equally struggling to, uh, with an unsure uh, situation where you've made an offer to a person and you don't know if the person is coming on. So uh, again, the hot selling skills, both are equally important. And of course, areas which are your strong domain knowledge where which is, uh, you know, something that has taken years to build. In that case, retention is important and equally challenged. Because if this person then leaves, you can keep hiring, but building that skill will take many years. Well, uh, let me answer this question uh, relating to the first, relating to the first part of your question. So this concept was very much, very much valid in that organization where I was working, where we weren't billing client on daily basis, right? There definitely it's a possibility. It's like you're you are unwell, you are or going on a family vacation. Simply you just tell that client that hey, I'm not there on this business day, right? Uh, so even the pens down day, it is always not like a surprise that, Hey, tomorrow it's a pen down day. We plan it, you know, team, we inform the teams that next week, Friday is a pen down day. So manage your clients, tell them that you have limited or no availability, something of that sort. Again, this was possible because we weren't into a TNM kind of, a, uh, you know, project, you know, unless and until we are like, actually 
billing our customers to attend phone calls, you know, uh, deliver something on daily basis. There, these concepts will not work, right? Maybe uh, what you can still do if, if there is a TNM kind of a project, you can not do a pens down for the entire organization, but you can do pens down for different teams or a different set of people at different times, uh, which we call it a skeleton model. So if there are 10 people working on a project, you will let five of them go on a pens down, but the remaining five will continue to work on the project. So that client work doesn't suffer. That's just an idea to, to take care of the TNM kind of a project. But we were, uh, at least I have never been into a company where uh, you know, we were billing clients on daily basis. It, it, we always had a long term project. Yeah, thank One week. I, I would say we do something very unique. Most organizations do that. But uh, like I was also mentioning during the discussion, there are regular rhythm calls that are set up. So, um, you know, uh, it's first 50, 60 uh, days at least. If it's a 60 day period, typically a two month notice period on an average. Uh, every week or 10 days, there is a touch point that's happening by either the hiring manager or the human resources person or the talent acquisition person or a buddy. Uh, you know, somebody or the other and just sending mailer is probably what we would stick to. So we would probably do that at the initial stage, but more about just picking up the phone and having a two minute conversation. That's something that we particularly do with our folks. Uh, because, you know, the moment you're speaking, uh, like I said, very simple example, if the person is not receptive to your call, the person is not returning your calls, you start sensing disengagement. So, which you wouldn't probably know if you have just sent an email because then you don't know if the person is reading it or not reading it. So, that's one thing that we certainly do. And of course, you know, uh, particularly during COVID, we actually had got into speaking to employees, looking at their health, figuring out how their families were doing, even for candidates who have been made offers and had not joined. So, uh, that gets to a next level of uh, human connect. So I think uh, what we try and leverage is that whole aspect of our human connection. That's, that's the only thing that we can do. I know of organizations which have goodie bags rolled out in between. So you can, people try to do all of those things. But like I said, unless you're really connecting with the person, you don't know which way the person is heading. So the question from live audience, I have a It's mix. Uh, we we do use social media for hiring. A uh, strong uh, push on internal referral, campus, and vendors. So the pie is quite well balanced from that perspective. Um, to be very honest, we started with tools. We did engage with Metal as a platform to try and take technical tests. Metal uh, to try and take technical tests and eliminate. Um, we ran into a little challenge where a person would say, "I'm not taking a test. I have to do all of this, and I'm not interested." So. We also faced that and then we said, okay, metal doesn't work for us. Um, we are actually constant and the way we reduce the cycle time is by doing these cluster interviews or so-called hiring drives over a period of two days. Uh, we have one going on today, actually, incidentally. So um, what it does is the levels get completed in a, in a period of two days, a period of three days. Because these are the developers and the architects who are also interviewing and they are working. So on a weekday, if we try and set up, one candidate will get interviewed today. The next round will probably happen only next week. So 
doing it in so far hiring drives get the time period shortened that's uh, what we have tried to do from reducing cycle time also reduce the number of rounds of interviews there's no point in multiple interviews five people speaking to the same guy and celebrating it's, it's really of no use so you uh, check on basic skills then you check a little bit if you're looking at leadership then you get into leadership discussions uh, or you look at design and architecture principles or whatever you would want to do so typically within three rounds you know if the guy is culturally fitting in and can add value or no instead of taking it to five rounds. That's where the average at the industry is. You're not an exception. Uh, you can try a lot of things, but so I think uh, this is something that I, th I think in the morning we were discussing this, right? So I saw that there was an, in one of the organizations I worked, so there was this person at a single digit annual salary came back with, we offered them 100% increment without asking, right? We gave that, this person after 15 days comes back, he has another 25% spike on the increment we gave. I offered that, it was a critical skill for us. And third time he came back, he had said, this is the last thing, this is what I do, I'm going to certainly join you. That's what he said. And then we gave him like another 30% on that part, right? That guy moved on to almost 4.5 times of his actual base salary to one of the largest, you know, e-commerce players in the in, in India, at a compensation of that level, right? Plus RSUs. And my entire team came back and asked me that I'm also an engineer. Shall I move to coding now? <laughs> <laughs> right. So jokes apart, uh, as Jyoti said, no organization is an exception. Uh, there are skills, there are functions, there are roles wherein the hit rate of joining is hundred percent. There are functions and skills that the hit rate of joining is not even 10%, right? But what you can actually do other than what numerous practices you see, whether even if you send them a limousine in front of their house and say that, listen, on the day of joining, this car will drop you to the office. If the person doesn't want to join, he would not join, even if you send a chopper for that matter, right? So what comes here is a very important data point that a lot of HR professionals and business leaders and hiring managers miss. There's something called interview we do when we hire. We don't interview someone and the person rejects the offer. It's something called in-depth talking to the person to pen down the nuances that why this person went. What organization ultimately, LinkedIn, Nokri, there's so many platforms you can check where this person went. For certain roles, we've tried that. Gone back, picked up the practices and said that, listen, these are the trends if you notice will not hire for this role. Somewhere it looked like a very radical call, but it really helped us. At least, at least we are not really burning with certain talent, wherein the renage rate is very high. Right? I think one of the practices that I can think of right now, other than what you would have seen, observed, heard from us as well, the traditionally part. So as an HR professional, as an HR partner, pick up that data point. Data really helps. Right? That's what I feel. Right? It really helps. You get to, you'll be able to take some informed decision. At, Definite decision that you know that okay, I am interviewing for X role at X experience. These are the trends that I noticed from these five candidates who did not join me. Let me go back and look at it. Is there a flaw in my interview process? 
is there a flaw in the way i am discussing the, is there a flaw in even projecting the you know the offer or the organization to the person those are the calls that we can take and perhaps can have some spike in future i can't really comment on that but can have some spike that's 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 another way Yeah. Yeah. So with that, uh, you may not have hundred percent hit rate on that. Maybe ten percent of them will answer. Yes. That ten percent will give you, will help you manage your rest of the ninety percent. At least you'll have some thread. And again, as I said, it depends from role. If there are people who are not joining because of whatever reasons, but when you try and engage, there are various ways you can have a. Another call done from somebody else. Check whether this person is really active or not. We've tried that for certain rooms. I've given one number to somebody I know. So let's call him up and say that is he really looking out for now or not? Day before joining, you think yes, I'm open to change. So that's these are the smart techniques you can follow, right? Again, as I said, there is no hundred percent hit rate anywhere, but these are mechanisms you can try at least. Yep. Right, thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. And um, once again, I'm back. I kicked off, so I'm supposed to also give a closure. But I must say that the quality of the questions you guys asked that shows that how deeply you were invested in what these guys are saying. And thank you very much. I think I appreciate the uh, the thought process which has been shared. I know and I agree with Jethi in a way that saying that we all are trying various ways by which we will be able to hire people and retain people. There is no straight away mathematics to do to it. And the inputs from Supreet and Bavor and, and the experience Mr. Gupta you shared. By the way, we love the we love that Shero Shairi as well, which was good for HR. We will keep that we'll keep that in mind. But at the end of the day, we I think we got something which we can go back with our organization. And I know that if you listen to 10 things, we just remember one and two, but that's good enough, right? If you can just remember one and two and go back and sincerely implement that, I believe that we will be able to make a change. I also believe that all the global audience who are watching us and sharing their comments uh, on the chat, um, they also got benefited out of all the conversation we had, uh, whether it is, uh, India, whether it is outside India, I think the problem is same everywhere, right? They are struggling with the same kind of problem. Happy if you guys have any perspective from your own countries, uh, feel free to share with us. Uh, we will definitely like to see and maybe get benefited out of that. With that said, again, uh, I would like to thanks to all our uh, speakers here and also our moderator for such an awesome session. Thank you very much. And once again, clap for them. <laughs>
Now start the set of basic uh, uh, learning. How do you? So to make this event successful, we also have our sponsors who came on board and gave us uh, their own uh, things. So we would like all our sponsors one by one to please come on the stage and give us a small speech about themselves. I would like to start with cyborgism by calling Ms. Pooja Gupta to please come. Thank you. Hola todos, my name is Pooja Gupta and I'm a global training manager, technical recruiter and a Spanish language enthusiast. So I am associated with Cyberism Private Limited, which is a corporate training company and which is also into outsourcing and consulting. Cyberism is into technical corporate training and non-technical corporate trainings like soft skills, coaching, mentoring, leadership programs. We have our presence in global as well. Uh, I am leading the verticals in global like uh, Latin America, basically Costa Rica, Mexico, Panama, in Europe, Czech Republic, Romania, Greece. In UAE also we have our presence in Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Australia, and we are still expanding more. Cyberism also comes up with the customized services like providing the technical interviewers for you know, shortlisting the candidates. We, we have found in past few years that a lot of man hours have been invested by the you know, team in recruiting these uh, technical talent. So we provide interviewers for that services. We are also into train and hire program where again, we reduce the man hours of the HR team and we train the, uh, we train the freshers and then give the opportunity to them to be hired by the companies. And uh, Yes, we do have one good news. As I mentioned before as well, we are going to have our open training in advance Excel. So you, all of you must be having a postcard on your table of advanced Excel training. So you can uh, grab the ex advanced Excel training by scanning the QR code and you will get 50% off to all the HRST members. So see you in the training then. Thank you everybody. I would now like to call upon just a moment. Praveen, can I request you to please be seated? Thank you. Uh, okay, now I would like to call upon uh, Ms. Mamta Sethi from Amrita Devi Foundation to come and introduce their organization to all of us. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, Mamta Sechi, and I am from Amrita Devi Foundation. Amrita Devi Foundation is basically an NGO. We are helping people of Uttarakhand, and we are basically empowering women over there by giving them some skill development courses. Like we are giving them computer training, we are giving them courses in tailoring and stitching, and we are providing courses in digital marketing. So uh, till now, uh, like we are working from last two hours, uh, two years, and till now we have trained around 100 girls in that courses. And uh, after that, we are looking after their placements, like job opportunity for them, uh, so that they can earn something or they can be independent and they can contribute in their families. And till now, uh, we have uh, founded approximately a placement for 10 girls who are like earning and who are helping their family and who are contributing um, something to their family and uh, who are self-independent now, basically. So this is our motto. And now we are focusing on uh, like uh, opening more centers. Now, till now we have four centers in uh, village Almora of uh, Uttarakhand. But yes, we are focusing on opening more centers and
training more and more girls over there uh, these courses we are running only for women and girls over there and uh, after doing these courses these girls get placements and these girls uh, are opening their own boutiques their own tailoring courses uh, tailoring uh, things they are doing at their home and uh, we are just looking for help from all of you in this cause uh, maybe you you can help in any way by donating something maybe by giving us some assistance or maybe by helping us in any way uh, to interact with uh, these girls or maybe um, you can just uh, uh, donate some something to them like we are looking for donations of laptop computer as we are uh, giving computer training to them so we are providing laptop to them during the course and uh, you can guide us you can help us you can assist us in any way you can and thank you so much in advance for your support and your guidance we are just looking for help from you thank you so much thank you babita now i would like to call upon adan priyanka from mathyaj to please come on the stage very good afternoon to all of you so i am priyanka uh, and she is my colleague sneha and we are from mathyaj mathyaj which is a corporate gifting company before i start something or anything i just want you all to answer me one thing what all kits or gifts you would like to give to your employees can i have any of the answers sorry t-shirt perfect any kind of kids like kids totally or anything any more answers sorry okay any more ha huh? birthday gift we received that anything yes sorry okay thank you So we make everything. All I can say is that Mathyaj provides you with all the gifts, every kind of gifts, whatever you want. So we here create a very friendly kind of environment for all your employees, and we guarantee you, whenever your employees will get a kit or a gift from Mathyaj, we guarantee you that that person will have a very big smile on your employee face. Okay. So this how, firstly. Attrition rate will be lower. Secondly, a good combination of kids when given to all your employees, it will actually affect a good environment, more friendly kind of environment. And third, this is how I believe lesser of resignation will be happening. So here, what we all do, um, this is a sample of joining kit, and I would like to ask my own colleague Sneha. That's me. How we are a gifting company. Yeah. We share all emotions. We sell emotions. Yes. Of so can you just explain what is that one kit you love the most? Um. Firstly, thank you so much for asking this. I just want to say, so one the most thing I like the most that is the women's jacket. Okay. So I have received the women's jacket from Master Shirts, my company. So I have received from a, a certificate in many more things. So I just said that was the best gift I have received. Yes. Totally women empowerment, huh? Yes, surely. That's really nice. So, not only we sell, we also get the boosting thing in our own company, and that is why I believe we, as a company, never get any kind of resignation feeling. So, I would really like you all to have uh, all the varieties of kits are there on the back table. Before you go, just have a look on it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Priyanka, now we have a big surprise element for all of you. Our country head UAE, which is Miss Charlotte Gibbons, she has sent a small uh, token of gift for our volunteers. 
which Govind has brought all from Dubai for all of us. Uh, but we would not like to limit it to our volunteers. We would also like to extend it to all the people who are here today uh, attending the session. So I would request Govind to please come here and uh, just give this bag or we can say. I would like to start with Mossy. Go ahead. Thank you so very much, Charlotte, for this. It's really wonderful. Thanks a lot. And with that said, uh, thank you everybody online uh, also and uh, have a nice day ahead.
Uh, see you in the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.